Hey, welcome back. In this video series, I'm going to show you how I built this beast of a cargo bike, which features full suspension, electric assist, cable steering, and lots of other neat features. So if you want to learn more about the design and fabrication process for this, just stick around. If you watched this channel before, you might have seen me build this cargo bike a few years ago, which was specifically designed to be easy to build with relatively basic metalworking tools, which is why a lot of things on this design are quite simplified compared to how I would have done things if it was just for myself. With the new bike, it's pretty much the opposite. I designed this as my own personal dream bike, so it includes every feature I've always wanted in a cargo bike. I didn't cut any corners with this or simplify things to make the build easier, so it's quite a bit more challenging to build this, which is why both the bike and this video took so long to make. Now let's look at some of the main design aspects. The idea with this bike is to be a good overall compromise between size, weight, handling and carrying capacity. So the goal wasn't to build a heavy hauler to move around fridges, but rather something practical to use every day. For that reason it's a bit shorter than the previous bike and this makes it lighter, stronger and also gives it a smaller turning radius and more responsive handling. The frame design is also quite a bit different. This one has a tall cage-like construction for the cargo bay and besides creating a very stiff and robust frame, this also turns the frame itself into a sort of basket, which makes transporting things more convenient because you don't have to strap everything down. A major new aspect is that this bike has electric assist, so the frame is specifically designed to neatly fit one of the most popular e-bike motors, the Bafang Mid-Drive. Next big feature is that this bike has full suspension for better comfort and ride quality. And this time I also built a cable steering system, which is something I've wanted to try for a while. So the steering for this one is solved using a set of pulleys and cables, which are also redundant for safety. We also have a completely new kickstand design, and to keep things light, the entire frame and most other parts will be made from round aluminum tubing instead of steel box section this time. The frame also features fully integrated electrical wiring, and I could go on and on about the features, but I will be covering most of this stuff in more detail as I'm actually building the bike. So for now, let's head to the shop and start making things. So same as usual, I'm going to use a donor frame for the rear end of the bike, and I happen to actually find two identical used frames just in case I want to build another bike or need to swap parts. There's lots of reasons why I'm using a donor frame rather than building the rear end myself. But to keep it short, it simply makes the build go much faster and there's really nothing specific to a cargo bike that I could improve upon in this area, so I'd rather concentrate my time and effort on the part of the bike that makes it a cargo bike. That being said, I didn't just pick any random frame. There's lots of considerations that went into choosing this specific frame, but it's one of the many things I unfortunately can't cover in detail in this video, but I do plan to talk about that in another video eventually. But back to the actual build, the first step is to take apart the donor frame and prepare it to be integrated into the new frame. So we're only gonna keep the top tube and C-tube from this frame, so I'm going to cut it apart at the head tube and then down here at the bottom bracket. At this point someone in the comments usually starts whining about me cutting apart a functional bike frame, so I just want to make it clear that this is an unremarkable mid-range mass-produced frame that's not even worth a lot of money nowadays because the design is quite outdated compared to modern mountain bikes and I also disagree with the notion that I'm destroying it. The way I see it I'm just repurposing it and giving it a second life as something much cooler and more useful than it was before. So this is the only part I'm actually gonna use and the next step is to clean up the remains of the old welds which unfortunately is a pretty tedious process because I have to be careful not to remove too much material from the actual bottom bracket shell. I also have to plug up this vent hole that was hiding inside the former down tube here, so I turned this little plug on the lathe and I'm gonna weld that in and then grind it flush again. The heat expansion actually made it easy to remove the old suspension bearings here, which will all be replaced with new ones when this gets reassembled. And now I can continue removing the rest of the welds and making everything nice and flush. After a lot more grinding, filing and sanding, I finally got this to a state where it looks pretty clean. Here you can see the before and after. 
And now it can go into my new frame jig, which works in conjunction with the welding cable. This jig is another one of those things I would have liked to show you in more detail, but I could probably do a 30 minute video just covering this. So like I said earlier, I will show you those things in another video, but for now we're going to focus on the bike itself. One advantage of a table-based frame jig is that I can actually draw the basic frame geometry onto my table. It's not strictly necessary since I obviously have digital plans for the bike that tell me all the measurements, but you can think of it more as a safety net to keep myself from making any dumb mistakes by always having a visual reference to see where things need to end up. Now it's time to prepare some of the tubing and in this build I'm using round tubing which makes things a bit more complex compared to building with square tubing because you don't have any flat sides to use as a reference but there's a few tricks to work around that. First I clamp each piece of tubing I'm going to use onto a flat surface, in this case the welding table and then I set this height gauge here to exactly half the diameter of the tubing. And now I can use it to scribe a straight line on each side, which is going to give me a reference point to work from for all of the upcoming operations. Obviously it's important that the tube doesn't move during this process, otherwise the lines won't match up. So this way I end up with two scribe lines that are exactly on the opposite sides of the tubing, so you can think of these as a reference for up and down or left and right. I also built some more frame building tools to help with this build. These things are called tube blocks and they have a hole with the exact same diameter as the tubing and the hole is also exactly in the center of these blocks. When I clamp these onto a piece of tubing and line them up with the scribe lines I just made, they now give me four square sides I can use as a reference, which essentially enables me to handle the round tubing as if it was square tubing. And that makes it a lot easier to drill and cut features that have to end up perpendicular to each other. For starters I'm just cutting the down tube roughly to length here and then I can mark the spot where I need to cut the first miter. To set up the saw I use this digital angle finder because I have to cut some pretty weird angles and this is more accurate than using the markings on the saw. Now I'm cutting the first miter and then I move the tube blocks in between the cuts and line them up with the scribe line again each time and that makes sure that all of these miter cuts actually end up in the correct orientation. Next I need to create this hole that allows the steering tube to pass through the down tube. So I'm marking its position and the steering tube is going in at a slight angle of 3 degrees in this case. So I'm using the little miter gauge here to set that up in the vise. And here you can see another feature of the tube locks. They also make it much easier and safer to clamp and hold round tubing in various machines and fixtures. And in this case they also give me a flat reference surface. Now that the hole is prepared, the tube is going back to the jig and to get it to the correct height in relation to the donor frame, I'm now using these standoffs which I just made from some aluminum extrusion cutoffs that were cut and then milled to the exact height that I need. I'm also setting up some stops here on the table so I don't have to align frame pieces by hand every time. And now I can already clamp the down tube into its position to act as a fixed point and then put in the other pieces that I prepared to see if everything matches up. Everything's looking good, so the next step is to cut the miter for the steering tube into the donor frame. After putting this on the mill, I am now aligning the frame inside the block because of course I need to make sure to cut this miter in the same plane as all the other ones. And then it also needs to be at a specific angle in relation to the steering tube which I am setting up here. 
As usual, the setup takes way longer than the actual cutting. And now this can go back into the jig to check the fit. And again, it's looking good. So I can now set up the steering tube in its own fixture. Now it's time to prepare the next piece, which is this little tube here that serves two purposes. First, it stiffens up the whole bottom bracket area down here, and it's also where the battery is going to be installed later. Apart from the miters, this tube also gets a bunch of holes, which brings me to a major topic for this build, which is internal cable routing. E-bikes and especially self-made e-bikes have a ton of cables and that can look very messy if you don't take care of it. So I planned this frame so that 90% of the cables can be hidden inside the frame, which requires a lot of thinking ahead and that's why I need to make sure to drill all of these holes in the correct positions before starting to weld anything. And that's why I'm now marking the spots where the steering tube meets the top tube and the battery tube, so I can prepare all the spots where cables are going to pass through later. Same goes for the battery tube now. I'm marking the positions here for installing the battery. These holes will later be fitted with rivet nuts and then I'm also milling another slot for the main power cable. And I also milled a matching slot into the battery base. Next up is this little connecting piece, which might look a bit weird at first, but there's a reason I picked this oval shaped tubing profile, because there's not a lot of space down here to integrate the motor into the frame. And this creates some clearance while being a lot stronger than a piece of round tubing with the same thickness would have been. Here it is after a bit of cleanup, and again the fit is looking great, so I'll move on to one of the trickiest cuts so far. I now need to cut this very steep miter into the end of the down tube to accept the front steering tube. I drew the rough outline of the cut onto the tubing here, but I'm not actually using these sketch lines to line up the cut. It's really just a visual aid for me to roughly see if things are in the correct orientation. Like the last few times, I first clamped the part lightly and then used the miter gauge and some gentle taps with a plastic hammer to get this to the right angle. I'll admit having this only clamped on the corner is a little bit sketchy, but with this thin aluminum tubing uh, the cutting forces aren't that high and I couldn't really figure out a better way to fixture this up. Since this is such a long cut, the hole saw is of course going to bottom out halfway through this cut. But it's not a big deal, I just used a little hacksaw to carefully remove the cutoff and now I can keep going. Now I just need to clean this cut up a little bit, drill some more holes and do a little prep work and then the main frame is almost ready to weld. The only part that's missing is the head tube, which is a little bit more involved. But before we get to that, just a quick little service announcement. 
I once again made a pretty elaborate set of plans for this build, which includes all the important measurements as well as the 3D model and material and parts lists. But just in case it's not obvious, I do want to mention that this one is not exactly a beginner project and making this does require some special tools and skills. But I did include a bunch of additional explanations to go over the more complex aspects of the build, so if you do feel up for it, just check the link in the description. So the head tube is a bit tricky because it can't have a smaller outside diameter than the down tube if I want the two to fit together, but it needs an inside diameter small enough to fit a 44mm headset cup. Which means if it was just a straight tube, it would have to have almost 6mm of wall thickness. That would not only make it pretty heavy, but it's also very tricky to weld together parts that have a large difference in material thickness. So to get around that, I'm going to use the lathe to turn a custom head tube, which is going to be thicker in the ends than it is in the center. The only standard size aluminum tubing I could find that gives me enough material to achieve this was this hefty 60 by 12 millimeter tubing, which is not ideal because it means I'm going to have to turn a lot of this into chips, but it's still a lot better than starting with a solid piece. After cutting it roughly to length, first I bring the outside diameter to the dimension that I want. And I also decided to add some grooves here, just for kicks, to give it more of a custom made look. And then I start to turn the inside to the diameter of the headset cups. Actually, slightly smaller because I'm going to create the final fit with a hand reaming tool later. And then began the tedious process of thinning out the center using a boring bar. I had to do this from both sides because the boring bar isn't long or rigid enough to reach all the way through. And unfortunately you can't really see what's going on inside and neither could I. With deep inside turning like this you just kind of have to trust the digital readout and hope you're not gonna crash into anything. After this was done I also added some threads to the thick part of the tube at the top and bottom and these are mounting points for potential accessories I may or may not build later on. So they're kind of optional, but it never hurts to have some spots on the frame where you can attach stuff. The tube also gets a vent hole in the back, and this all took way longer than it looks in the video, but the head tube is now finished, so I can test the fit with the down tube, which is also looking good, which means I can do the final fixturing for attack welding, and put all the fully prepared tubes back into the jig and align and clamp everything down. Everything is clamped up now, so it's finally time to place the first tack welds. The downside of having the jig flat on the welding table like this is that I can only place tack welds on the side that's facing up right now, but I'm just gonna tack the other side once it's out of the jig, and thankfully due to having this super rigid table setup, I can later use the jig to check for and correct any distortion that might have happened during welding. There's also freestanding frame jigs where you can weld the entire frame while it sits inside the jig. So there's some different philosophies on which way works better, but for me this setup makes a lot of sense because I pretty much never built the same thing twice. So it's great to have the flexibility to make all kinds of weird frames with this, which wouldn't fit into a standard bike frame jig anyway. After attacking up the first side, I can now loosen all the fixtures and take this out in one piece. It's not very strong at this point, but it's enough to take a look at it and put some wheels in, just to check if everything looks roughly correct. And so far everything's looking pretty good, so that means I didn't make any bonehead mistakes with the geometry. So I can now move on and tack up the opposite side. Some time ago I built this motorized bike crane here, which I also made a video about, and this is extremely useful not just for bike maintenance, but also frame building, because it now allows me to quickly move the frame into a comfortable position for each weld, which is pretty much the most important thing if you want to get decent tick welds. After tacking up the other side, I then went straight to running the first beads. Last time I did lots of welding in a video, a lot of people complained that the light was blinding them somehow, 
I'm not sure how to start to explain why it's physically impossible for welding arc to hurt you through a screen, but it did inspire me to try some new filming techniques. So to make the welding part look less bright and also more interesting, I rigged up a filter cassette from one of my old welding helmets to the camera lens. And that way you can now see something that looks a little bit closer to what I'm actually seeing during welding. So while we're looking at a bunch of welding shots, I figured I'd use the time to answer two common questions about that. One thing people ask a lot is what are your weld settings? The truth is I often have no idea which settings I used at the time, but I can tell you that there's no secret magic recipe that suddenly gives you perfect welds by turning a few knobs. So I'd rather refer you to the many great welding specific YouTube channels which do a very good job at explaining what the settings actually do and how you can figure out the correct ones for whatever you're trying to do yourself. As with most things, I'm self-taught when it comes to welding and I'm by no means an expert. I actually don't even consider myself to be very good at this. I think my TIG welding is decent enough for what I'm trying to achieve, but I have a lot of bad habits and there's certainly lots of things I could still improve. So I'm not necessarily the best teacher in this field, but if I can give you one piece of advice, it's that getting good welds will always be 99% practice and there's just no way around that. Obsessing over which machine and settings you use is like trying to become a great guitar player by buying the most expensive guitar. It's just not how it works. Another question that comes up a lot with aluminum welding is what about the heat treatment? It's true that professionally produced bike frames are usually heat treated after welding. That means they're heated and cooled to very specific temperatures in a very controlled process. And the goal is to relieve tension in the material and mitigate some of the loss in tensile strength, both of which occur during welding. But personally, I've never heat treated anything I've built from aluminum and you can see on my channel I've built quite a few things over the years. Not a single one of those ever had a single weld crack or break in all this time, so in my personal experience, it's not strictly necessary as long as the construction itself is sufficiently overbuilt and you're not pushing things to the limit. But that's just me. I'm not an engineer and I didn't do the math on any of this. All I can tell you is that I'm still riding bikes I built from aluminum many years ago and I've put thousands of kilometers on them and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. So use that information however you like. Now that all the main welds are finished, I can put the frame back into the jig and check for distortion, which is one of the things that the welding table really excels at. So all of these cones here are turned to be very precise and they're all set up with their center at the exact same distance from the welding table, which represents a very flat reference to measure against. And that way we can now see that the C-tube distorted downward slightly, but otherwise the rear end is looking pretty straight. However, in front there's quite a bit of distortion, which is pretty much what I expected to happen. You can see here that the distance between the frame and the standoffs varies quite a bit, which also means that the head tube has moved upwards. And the distortion originates from this joint down here, which pulled the last segment of the down tube out of alignment. Another cool thing about the table setup is I can actually measure the distortion quite easily. I can just zero the height gauge in an area where the tube has the correct distance from the table and then I can measure the difference at the head tube, which comes out to about 7 millimeters. To fix that I'm gonna do what you call cold setting, which essentially just means using brute force to bend things back into shape. 
Of course you want to do this carefully in order not to overshoot the goal, so I keep checking in between with the height gauge until eventually I end up with the same measurement everywhere and now it also fits into the cones again. With that little adjustment the main part of the frame is now finished and we can start building this cage around, which is quite tricky because there's a lot going on here with all these different angles. First I'm just gonna cut all the straight miters that make up the corners. And just like the down tube I'm relying on the tube blocks to make sure all the cuts are lined up with each other later. Here's how I mark my cuts when I'm actually going for a precision. I just put some marker in the rough area and then I scribe a line on that, which makes it much less likely you'll mistake some random scratches for your scribe line. Not that that's ever happened to me. One tube was also delivered with a dent in it, so I made sure to mark that area so I can avoid using that part of it. Then I point a light at the spot where I want to cut and look at the band sub light directly from above to line it up with the scribe line. And this usually gives me decent enough precision without having to do any touch-ups. But as fast and easy as it might look here, I also do quite a bit of double checking before actually making critical cuts like these. And that also goes for making sure I'm cutting at the correct angle. After some deburring, here's all the separate parts ready to be assembled, and you guessed it, it's now time to come up with another fixture for this. You might have noticed by this point that fixturing is kind of the core ingredient to building bikes or any other kind of precision weldment, which is why a lot of the work revolves around figuring out how to align things and hold them in place. If you mass produce something like this, you would build dedicated fixtures for every part, but since I usually only build stuff once, I tend to come up with the fixtures on the spot and only use them temporarily and um, this really drives home why I got this welding table and why I'm still so excited about it. Because as you can see here I can now quickly set up a fixturing solution that not only holds the parts in place, it also allows me to check for distortion after welding, just like I did with the main frame. In this case, since I'm building the same part twice, the fixture also makes sure that both of these end up identical, so it really reduces the chances of messing things up, because as soon as something doesn't line up inside the fixture, it tells me that one of the cuts must be off, so then I can fix that before welding it. Now the two side pieces are tacked up and there's a reason I placed the tack welds at about 45 degrees from the top. This leaves the top surface of that part flat, which means I can flip it over and clamp it flat against the table to tack the other side. Just like the main frame, after both sides are tacked, I can place these back into the fixture and check if they still fit, which they do, so now I can start running the full beads. Here's the two sides fully welded now and they go back into the fixture one last time to do the final alignment. As expected there's a little bit of distortion again. You can see here that the angle is slightly off on one side, but it's nothing too dramatic. So again I can fix that by just forcing it back into alignment using the same fixture for support and to check against. <laughs> 
Now that these are all prepared, I need to figure out how to cut these round miters. It seems pretty complicated at first because there's a lot of intersecting angles, but it gets a lot easier with the right approach and that involves cutting both sides at the same time. And surprise, this involves building yet another fixture, which I'm going to whip up from one of my favorite materials, which is aluminum extrusion. A lot of people seem not to know about this stuff, so you can think of it like a set of Legos. It's a modular system you can use to build all kinds of stuff by attaching these T-nut profiles together with various methods. And the flexibility that it gives you makes this perfect for prototyping work, which is basically what I do here. The idea is to build a frame that accurately holds these two parts in position in relation to each other so that I can handle them as if they were one part. And then we're going to move the entire thing over to the milling machine and do the miter cuts. Here I'm setting up some of these angles to be spaced apart according to the inside width of the cage. And then when I place the tubing in there, they act as stops, making sure everything is parallel and evenly spaced. I also marked the center line exactly between the two parts, which is going to help me line up the cut later. And it also shows me I need to take off a little bit of material here so that these ends don't collide with each other. Now that everything fits, I'll just add these cutoffs here to hold them down and some clamps so everything stays in place. And now this entire thing can be picked up and brought over to the mill. One thing I like about this machine vise is that it's surface ground on all sides, which means I can just slide my jig onto the side of the vise here to square things up. And then the whole jig also gets secured to the mill using a toe clamp. Next step is to find the center from my miter cut and as you remember I marked the center line on the jig both in the front and the back so that allows me to just get a long straight edge aligned with those lines and then I can use that edge as a center reference. Since I don't really need to chase hundreds of a millimeter for a bike frame I'm just lining up the center by eye here using a pointy tool. Next step is to actually set the angle at which I need to cut the miter and previously I changed the angle of the workpiece to achieve this, but with a large jig that just creates too many additional headaches, so instead I'm actually going to tilt the head of the mill in this case. I usually avoid doing this as much as I can because tramming the head back in to be perfectly square to the table is kind of a pain, but in this case I'll make an exception. Last but not least, I'm clamping a sacrificial piece of wood to the ends of the tubes here, to stabilize them and also make sure the ends line up with each other. And now after all that preparation, we're finally able to make the first cut. On a side note, a classic mistake I've made before is to do a ton of setup like this and then making a really stupid mistake like forgetting to actually use the correct size hole saw. It's often the small simple things you screw up, but luckily in this case I used the right one. Now with the first side cut, I just need to flip the whole jig around and do the same thing on the other side. With that, those miters are done now, and by the way, this whole process took me the better part of a day to set up, with the actual cuts only taking a few minutes to do, and that's exactly why mass-produced things are cheap and handmade things are very expensive. So to answer one of the most common questions I get, this is also the main reason I can't build a bike for you and sell it, because with the amount of hours I put into a one-off prototype like this, I can guarantee you would not want to pay the amount that I'd have to charge, even if I worked at minimum wage. But back to the build, the fit with the rest of the frame is looking good so far, so the next step will be to actually attach the side pieces. But first I put the frame back into the jig to do one last checkup and see if everything is straight because I actually need to disassemble the frame jig now and put it in a different configuration for the next steps. Since I designed this jig to work in conjunction with the table, I can actually set it up vertically now by installing the main piece that holds the bottom bracket to one of these angle brackets. 
And then I can level out the down tube and hold it at the head tube as well. And now everything should be squared to the table again. So I can keep using that as a reference to attach everything else. And for that I'm once again improvising some further additions to the setup by using some T-slot profiles again. I put together these two columns that I can attach to the table and they now each get a horizontal piece on top and that's gonna hold the other frame parts. Since the table itself is leveled I can now just use the little angle box to see if my jig is square to the table and therefore to everything else. With these supports set up I can make sure the side pieces are parallel and at the correct height and then I'm using a ratchet strap with some light pressure to pull them against the frame. But I'm not going to start welding anything yet. I first want to make and attach these bottom side pieces which add some stiffness to the frame and also provide a place to mount the kickstand. Making these is basically the same process as the pieces you saw before, except it's actually a bit simpler because there's no fancy angles, it's just straight 90 degrees. But I did set up a little jig for it on the table again, mostly to measure and fix the distortion. In this case the mitering is also quite easy because as you saw I built the two side pieces as one piece which allows me to now cut them apart and miter them in the same operation. All I need to do is cut the miter right in the center and at the right angle and then I end up with two separate pieces which now each need an additional miter on the other end to interface with the upper side pieces. Back at the welding table I can check the fit again for these miters which is looking good so I can set up another little contraption at the bottom here which I will use to clamp and align these to the frame. It's just another piece of extrusion and some sheet metal to get the surface to the right height so that I can clamp the tube blocks onto it and have the miters match up with the down tube. All the fixtures are set up now and this is almost ready to weld. I just need to do one more thing before I start with that, which is to drill some vent holes. So I'm marking the positions where the tubes intersect and then I'm drilling some small holes. The reason for the vent holes is if you weld any hollow structure like this frame, then as you're heating up the material there will be expanding gases inside the frame that have to escape somewhere. Which doesn't really become a problem until the point where you finish the last weld and seal the hollow structure. In that last moment the only way for the expanding gas to escape is into your weld puddle, which is guaranteed to mess up the weld and create all kinds of problems. So by drilling the holes we're giving the gas an escape route because it can move from one tube to the next and so on until it finally escapes out of one of the open ends of the frame. And now everything is prepared. I've triple checked every angle and made sure everything is parallel and symmetrical so I can once again start placing tag welds. Once I was done tacking in every spot that I could reach somewhat comfortably from this position, the frame should hold together well enough that I can remove it from the jig and I'd say at this point it's actually starting to look like something. But before I start doing the final welds, there's one last thing I gotta add, which is the side supports that are going to hold the cargo bay surface. These parts have a really flat angle designed into them that my bandsaw isn't normally able to cut, so I came up with a slightly sketchy improvised clamping setup here, which ended up working just fine, so it once again shows how versatile these cheap bandsaws are. Next I'm drilling the mounting holes and also a whole bunch of other holes that people in the bike world sometimes call speed holes because they don't really serve any purpose 
other than slightly reducing the weight and making things look more engineering. For the miter cuts, I'm going to use the same method I used for the last part, which is to simply cut straight down the center to miter and separate these parts in the same step. But the hole saw doesn't have enough cutting depth again, so I need to flip the part in between and go from both sides. Aligning these is a bit more simple in this case because there's no fancy angles. I just need these to be square to the frame and also level to the ground. Since I can only tag these from the top right now, the walls are going to pull these parts upwards, which I fully expect, but we're going to fix that in a minute. The welding distortion is an annoying part of welding that you always have to deal with, there's just no way around that but it gets a lot easier once you anticipate it instead of having it sneak up on you. Now that the frame is out of the jig again, I'll pull these pieces here back into alignment by clamping something straight on the bottom and this forces them to be parallel again, at which point I can place tack walls on the bottom. And with that done, it's now finally time to run full beats on all the remaining parts. So I think finishing the frame is a good place to end the first video. I hope you enjoyed this one and be sure to check back for the second one where I'm going to be doing a lot of machining to build the steering mechanism and the kickstand. And there's also going to be a bunch of assembly and electrical stuff and of course seeing the finished bike in action. And then if you still haven't had enough, the plan is to make a third video to go over some details in this build that I couldn't fit into these other videos and also to answer some common questions about this and other bike builds. So if you already have specific questions you want answered, just drop them in the comments and I'm going to pick up some of those for when the time comes. Until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.